The German Jewish philosopher Theodor Adorno once stated famously that it would be barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz. Really? Why? Is it barbaric in the sense that poetry is only supposed to occupy itself with the moon in June or with doves in love? Can't poetry also be an expression of deep personal suffering, a legitimate expression of condolence or of trauma, or simply communicating experiences which otherwise can't be communicated in normal everyday language? And anyway, Adorno, who spent the years of Nazi persecution of the Jews safely in exile in Los Angeles, shouldn't he have asked someone with a closer personal connection to the Holocaust? Shouldn't he have asked someone who was personally affected, who suffered, who perhaps lost a lot? Well, shouldn't he have asked Nellie Sachs? Nellie Sachs was born in Berlin in the suburb of Schöneberg in the year 1891, and she grew up in what the Germans call a Großbürgerliche Familie, a family of the upper middle classes. And what they meant by this was that her father was a wealthy industrialist who made a lot of money producing rubber products. This was in the days before ubiquitous plastic, when rubber was a very important commodity. And this secured her a very comfortable lifestyle, her and her parents' family. And the father was also an assimilated Jew, meaning that he had more or less turned his back on Jewish religious and cultural practices, at least on the open profession of these practices in favor of what looked like a general German lifestyle. And this was something that a lot of Jews were doing at the time because they had struggled for centuries to try and gain some kind of acceptance in secular German society. And now they were finally getting that acceptance and they didn't want to lose it. So it's 1891, Gerhard Hauptmann had just left Berlin and moved to Silesia where he would write The Weavers. Thomas Mann, 16 years old, and his father has just died. Hermann Hesse is 14 years old, and as we know, he is a high school student struggling through bouts of depression and on the verge of suicide. And Elias Canetti has not yet been born. Nellie Sachs was a lifelong poet. She started writing poetry when she was 17 years old. She didn't have her first poetry volume published until 1921 when she was 30 years old, but she'd been writing quite a lot in the interim. And she lived in Berlin in what was probably the most exciting period in the city's whole history, the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties in Berlin. This was the period known as the Weimar Republic, and it was a period characterized by extreme polarization politically between the right and the left, the right wing, the rising tide of fascism in Europe and particularly in Germany, the left wing, the communists and the socialists who were struggling for increased power and recognition. And in the early 20s, there were running street battles in Berlin. But this is also a decade that was important for Jewish intellectuals. The universities had been opened to Jews in 1918, and we see a lot of prominent intellectuals in the universities. Albert Einstein, Theodore Adorno, Adorno's friend Max Horkheimer, um, Herbert Marcuse, Ernst Cassirer, some names you would recognize, some you won't. But this was a time when Jewish intellectuals were really playing an extremely important role in German public life. Culturally, too, the arts were thriving. 
in painting and in literature, the movement called Expressionism had been around for a couple of decades already, and it was still an important force in the arts. Um, it would slowly morph into what's called Neue Sachlichkeit, the new objectivity, towards the end of the decade. But at the beginning of the decade, it blossomed in the, to this incredibly anarchistic and wild movement known as Berlin Dada, which was an attack on language, on tradition, on literature, on performance, pushing the limits all the way. It was also a decade of great innovation in German cinema, and we see these important movies appearing, movies like Dr. Caligari, Nosferatu, Metropolis, and it was also the age of the cabaret. All of this seems to have somehow passed Nelly Sachs by. She was withdrawn. She didn't appear to be terribly interested in the politics of the day, and she certainly wasn't interested in experimenting in um, literary forms, at least not in the boundary-pushing ways of some of the other movements of the time. She was going to remain throughout her life more or less a traditional poet, if that expression has any meaning at all, but she's still going to struggle and experiment with how to push language in order to express a very personal view of suffering in the world, of individual and collective suffering, herself and the Jewish people. So she seems both related and removed from those, liter those literary experiments like, for example, Alfred Döblin's Berlin Alexanderplatz, or the works even of Thomas Mann's son Klaus, who wrote politically engaged works, but also experimented with open professions of his own sexuality, his own homosexuality. This was a time when Jews were not only intellectually thriving, but increasingly under threat. And Nellie Sachs later described this life under threat. That was her own expression. Living life then was living life under threat. And she wrote, My greatest wish on earth is to die without being murdered. During the 1930s, when the Nazis were in power, Sachs started to have run-ins with the authorities. She was interrogated several times by the Gestapo, the Geheime Staatspolizei, the Nazi secret police. Not really because she was Jewish and not really because of her own political convictions, more because she associated with some members of the resistance. And the Nazis, of course, were doing everything they could to root out the resistance and to try to uncover anyone who stood between them and absolute power. So one of her friends was very active in the resistance, a man whose name no one has ever found out, but we know that they had a close friendship and that he was tortured to death by the Nazis. And he appears in her poems as Der Bräutigam, the bridegroom. And she mentions him several times in her poetry. In fact, one of her poems is titled Prayer for the Dead Bridegroom. The votary candle I have lit for you flickers, speaking flame language with the air. And water drops from my eye, from the grave. I hear your dust calling to eternal life. O oh, high, trysting place where poverty dwells, if I, only I knew what the elements mean. They point to you, for everything always points to you. All I can do is weep. These interrogations were incredibly traumatic for Nellie Sachs because she had decided to keep quiet about her friendship. She didn't want to betray anyone. And so keep quiet she did, up to the point where after one interrogation she went home and she was actually unable to speak for several days. 
around this time, she also started to immerse herself more and more in Jewish culture, Jewish religion, and Jewish mysticism. And the Jewish mysticism would mark all of her writings afterwards. We'll see this in the play Eli, which we read this week. Sex struggled with forms of expression, and at one stage she wrote, Das ist des Menschen Größe und Not, Sehnsucht nach Stille. The greatness, but also the need or the desperation or the predicament of human beings is their longing for quiet. This is an idea that we find cropping up again and again in her writings, the longing for quiet and the significance of words and of speech. And again, we can think of Adorno, which is better, to keep quiet after trauma or to speak the trauma, to try to give form to trauma in experiments with language, in poetry, because that's what poetry is, experiments with language. Sachs knew that there was no future for her in Germany, and as the 1930s progressed, she started making plans to move to Sweden. But it wasn't until the late 1930s that she finally succeeded in getting a visa, and she moved to Sweden in 1940 together with her mother. And it was really just the very last moment that she managed to get out of Germany, because orders had already been issued for her to de be uh, deported to a concentration camp and to certain death. So she arrived safely, but very troubled, in Sweden, and she settled there with her mother, and she learned the Swedish language, and she made a living translating Swedish poems into German, as she continued to write her own poetry as well. And she also wrote plays. So she wrote Eli, and she wrote another play, probably her other well-known play, Abraham im Salz, Abraham in Salt. As news of the Holocaust spread, she continued to write, and she started to turn her attention to giving poetic expression to this terrible collective experience. In other words, she wrote poetry after Auschwitz. For example, probably her best known poem, O oh, die Schornsteine, O oh, the Chimneys. O oh, the chimneys, O oh, the ingeniously devised habitations of death, when Israel's body drifted as smoke through the air, was welcomed by a star, a chimney sweep, a star that turned black. Or was it a ray of sun? Oh, the chimneys, freedom way for Jeremiah and Job's dust, who devised you and laid smoke upon stone, the road for refugees of smoke. Oh, the habitations of death, invitingly appointed for the host who used to be a guest. O oh, you fingers laying the threshold like a knife between life and death. O oh, you chimneys, O oh, you fingers, and Israel's body as smoke through the air. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about this poem because I think if we look at it more carefully, we can see something about what Nellie Sachs is hoping to achieve in her poems or perhaps something about the impulses that makes her write her poetry. If you look at the way it's structured or the way the voice, the poem's voice, the poet's voice, the lyrical voice appears in this poem, then first of all, there's something quite striking. In a way, there are two rhetorical stances in the poem, two rhetorical modes of expression, if you want or rhetorical figures. The one is the exclamations, O oh, the chimneys, the dwellings of death, O oh, the fingers, O oh, you fingers. Israel's body in smoke through the air, often marked by an exclamation mark and introduced by this word O, oh, which O oh, and an exclamation mark always points to some shortcomings of language, some limits of language, some inadequacy which the poem is trying to address, some inadequacy of meaning. So we have that, 
And then on the other hand, we have the asking of questions. Um, questions, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, the smoke of Israel's body, um, was it a star turning black that welcomed it? A star that turned black or was it a ray of sun? That's the first question. And then the second question in the second stanza, who devised you? Two questions. What welcomed the smoke of death? And who devised these habitations of death? Um, so let's just briefly look at this. Exclamation, as I said, it expresses some kind of an astonishment beyond language. But it also brings emotion into speech in a way that's not entirely clear in this poem. There, there is a kind of a suppressed emotion in the poem, which, which gives the poem its power. The asking of questions rhetorically, it's much more complex. And, and you can look at this complexity on a really excellent rhetorical website, uh, which I'm just listing at the bottom of the page now. If you start to examine this, that will show you how complex the asking of questions can be. So we might be talking about um, interrogatio, simply asking a question. We might be talking about anachoanosis, which is asking the listener to judge on a matter. We might be talking about exercitatio, which is moving the listener with your own emotions, in a way trying to pass your emotions onto the listener. And we might be talking about epiplexus, which is using questions to somehow prod and prompt the listener. And these questions, what, what was it what, that received the body of Israel? Was it a star? Was it a ray of sunshine? Was it a star that turned black? Is there any ray of hope in this process? This might also simply be aporia, which is just asking a question that you don't understand the answer to, probing into a mystery. And then a different kind of a question, who devised you? And this is the question of trying to work out what this was all about. How was it possible that a human mind could think this up? And the question, who devised you, it points back to the second line of the poem, the ingeniously devised habitations of death. Um, the German for ingeniously devised is sinnreich erdacht which literally means thought up through much contemplation, the habitations of death that were thought up through much contemplation. Who did that? Who did that? And the word sinnreich, much contemplation, it carries the word zin in it, which means meaning. And what's interesting about this poem with its exclamations and its questions is that there is meaning in this process of murder for the murderers. They thought it up ingeniously. But is there meaning for the victims, for the murdered? Is there any meaning for the survivors? This question, which Nellie Sachs asks in this poem almost 20 years after she fled Nazi Germany, and 15, 14, 13 years after the horrors of the Holocaust became visible for the world. This question is made possible, in fact it's made necessary and urgent by the remaining physical presence of these chimneys, by the remaining presence of the stones. And I'd like you to remember that because stones are an important, an important figure in Nellie Sachs's poetry and also, by the way, in Paul Zeland's poetry, because stones remain, stones don't forget. Stones prompt us with their physical presence to 
voice our astonishment at the murder and to ask questions why. In the post-war years, her volumes of poetry were not, first of all, published in West Germany. They were initially published in East Germany. So in 1947, a volume of poems appears called In den Wohnungen des Todes, In the Dwellings of Death. Then 1949, Sternenverdunklung, The Darkening of Stars. And in the 1950s, she entered into correspondence with that other great German-Jewish poet who had tried to come to terms with the Holocaust in his writings, Paul Celan. Paul Celan, who wrote the famous Totusfuge, the Fugue of Death. Paul Celan was a reader of Nellie Sachs's poetry. He read the poem Chorus of Stones. We stones, when someone lifts us, he lifts the foretime. When someone lifts us, he lifts the Garden of Eden. When someone lifts us, he lifts the knowledge of Adam and Eve and the serpent's dust-eating seduction. When someone lifts us, he lifts in his hand millions of memories which do not dissolve in blood like evening. For we are memorial stones embracing all dying. And when he read this poem, he answered it with his own poem, Whichever Stone You Lift. Whichever stone you lift, you lay bare those who need the protection of stones, naked. Now they renew their entwinement. Whichever tree you fell, you frame the bedstead where souls are stayed once again, as if this eon too did not tremble. Whichever word you speak, you owe. To destruction. Stones. You will have noticed stones are an important image in Nelly Sachs's poems, and we can ask ourselves why, what they stand for, what they might mean for her. We're only going to be able to answer this question by looking at the context in which they appear in her poems. Sachs and Ceylon, Ceylon was living in Paris, they entered into correspondence and she wrote a letter to him which she began, Dear Poet Paul Ceylon. Dear Poet Paul Ceylon, now I have your address from the publisher and can thank you personally for the deep experience that your poems gave me. You have an eye for the spiritual landscape that lies hidden behind everything here and power of expression for the quiet unfolding secret. I too must walk this inner path that leads from here towards the untold sufferings of my people and gropes onwards out of the pain. And later, this is and was in me. There is and was in me, and it's there with every breath I draw, the belief in transcendence through suffusion with pain, in the inspiritment of dust, as a vocation to which we are called. I believe in an invisible universe in which we mark out our dark accomplishment. I feel the energy of the light that makes the stone break into music and I suffer from the arrow tip of longing that pierces us to death from the very beginning and pushes us to go searching beyond where the wash of uncertainty begins. Finally, in 1960, they managed to meet in a cafe in Zurich, in Switzerland, and after this meeting, Ceylan wrote the poem, Our Talk Was of God. Our talk was of your God. I spoke against him. I let the heart. I had hope. For his highest death rattled his wrangling word. Your eye looked at me, looked away. Your mouth spoke toward the eye. I heard. We really don't know, you know. We really don't know what counts. In 1970, after a lengthy struggle with depression and trauma, Ceylon finally threw himself from a bridge into the River Seine in Paris and drowned. And in the 
that very same year Nellie Sachs died. In fact, she died on the day of Paul Celan's funeral. But by the time of her death, she had gained recognition in Germany, not just East Germany, but also in West Germany, where her volumes of poetry started to be published. So there was the volume 1957, Und niemand weiß weiter, and no one knows how to continue. 1959, Flucht und Verwandlung, Flight and Change, or Flight and Metamorphosis. And in that same year, the play Eli was broadcast as a radio play in the radio station Südwestfunk. In 1966, on her 75th birthday, Nellie Sachs was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. And as the prize committee stated, it was to acknowledge her outstanding lyrical and dramatic writing, which interprets Israel's destiny with touching strength. The turn to Jewish mysticism seems to have been an important key for Sachs, an important door that opened up an experience of living life as a Jew in Europe without being threatened with murder, perhaps a way to die without being murdered, or perhaps even to live without being murdered. Eli is a series of more or less disjoint scenes. The scenery itself is quite interesting. If you look at the stage directions before each scene, there is something cinematic about it. It presents a market square in the first scene, and then in the second scene we have the same square, but the directions tell us from a different camera angle, if you will. Easy to do in cinema, but quite difficult to do in the theatre. And then the camera moves back and we see the same scene, but from farther away. Interesting to think about why Sachs is doing this and what kind of an effect it might have in the theatre. And as we read the play, it's a little bit difficult to piece together what exactly is happening or what the significance of these characters with their biblical names might be. Sachs wrote a postscript to Eli and in a way, it's helpful to read the postscript first because it gives us a kind of a guide on how to read this play, on what exactly is happening, and perhaps in a sense also why it's happening. So we read there that the lead figure, the protagonist, Michael, is a figure taken from Hasidic mysticism, where he is one of the secret servants of God who, 36 in number and quite unaware of it themselves, carry the invisible universe. And you can imagine what a comforting thought this might be to Sachs, that there is a figure like Michael who is carrying the invisible universe, while at the same time in their visible actions they are in pursuit of the murderer of the boy Eli. According to the prophet Isaiah, she writes, the Lord puts the arrow he had used back in its quiver so that it may remain in darkness. And thus Michael feels darkly the inner call to seek the murderer of the child Eli, the child who raised to heaven the shepherd's pipe with which he used to call the cattle together. And he was raising his pipe to heaven because of the outrage of the murder of his parents. So we have this pattern in the play of witnessing horror and speaking, or witnessing horror and acting and responding. Witnessing in horror and not being a victim, but giving speech, giving action, taking consequences, and perhaps ultimately even finding justice in the face of horror and murder. <laughs> 
Remember Canetti's concern with the meaninglessness of death and how to give form and meaning to experiences of death. Well, here we have a very specific historical experience of death, of mass murder, and we have an attempt to find meaning in the meaninglessness of this horror, this trauma, this mass murder, this genocide. And it's interesting that Sachs also writes in the postscript that this mystery play was the outcome of a terrible experience of the Hitler time at the height of its smoke and flame and was written down in a few nights after my flight to Sweden. Notice also that she speaks about the rhythm of the play. She says it was written in a rhythm which must make the Hasidic mystical fervor visible also in mime to the performer, the encounter with the divine radiance which accompanies each of our everyday words. The divine radiance which accompanies each of our everyday words. So if you can't stay silent, then you have to be able to give some kind of a divine radiance to words. And I think that's exactly what she tries to do here. I mean, look at how the play begins. The scene is a marketplace in a small Polish town and a washerwoman appears and we learn that she's carrying a basket full of white linen, white linen. She washes, she's a washerwoman, she purifies and um, this has a direct connection to the bloodstained shirt of Eli and she's chanting and listen to how she chants. From the laundry, the laundry I come, from washing the garments of death, from washing the shirt of Eli, washing out the blood, washing out the sweat, child sweat, washing out death. To you, Samuel, will I bring it, to the cattle lane bring it at evening, where the bats flutter around in the air as I flutter the Bible pages. Look at the way she uses language. Look at the if I can call it this, the ceremonious and elevated use of language, the use of inversion, in other words, not the normal grammatical syntax, but changing the word order in order to have this kind of ceremonious effect in language. And she's going to, st she's going to sustain this right the way through the play. It's as if we are witnessing words and images that have a significance far beyond their everyday usage. And I think this is what she means by the radiance, a kind of a divine radiance of words. It's almost as if she's saying to us, I can speak words to you which are so pregnant with meaning that you will be able to see in these words the significance of life in the face of death and in the face of horror. Let's get back to Theodore Adorno for a moment. As I mentioned, it was 1959, the year that Eli was read aloud on the radio, that he wrote in his book Kulturkritik und Gesellschaft, Cultural Critique and Society, that it would be barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz. Now in that same year, Nelly Sachs wrote the poem how many homelands? How many homelands play cards in the air when the refugee goes through the mystery? How much sleeping music in the tangled branches where wind lonesomely plays midwife? Cleft by lightning, alphabet leaf root forest sows God's first word into devouring reception. Fate flinches in the blood traversed meridians of a hand. Endless is everything and suspended on rays of distance. Two years previously, she had written the poem, That is the Fugitive's. That is the Fugitive's planetary hour. That is the Fugitive's rending flight into epilepsy, death. That is the star's fall from its magic fastness into the threshold, bread and hearth. That is the black apple of knowledge, fear, extinguished sun of love that smokes. That is the flower of haste, sweat-soaked. Those are the hunters of nothingness, only of flight. Those are the hunted who carry their deadly shelters with them into the grave. <laughs> 
that is the sand startled with garlands of parting, that is the earth thrust into freedom, its halting breath in the humble air. In 1966, Theodore Adorno published what is probably his philosophical masterpiece, which he gave the title Negativa Dialectic, Negative Dialectics. And in it, he kind of took back what he had said about poetry after Auschwitz. He wrote the following lines. Perennial suffering has as much right to expression as a tortured man has to scream. Hence, it may have been wrong to say that after Auschwitz, you could no longer write poems. Perennial suffering has a right to expression. A tortured person has the right to scream. You cannot tell a poet to stay silent after Auschwitz. You cannot stop a poet from this struggle with expressive language, this struggle to give words and to push the limit of words in order to try to communicate and to express this sense of loss and trauma and suffering and personal damage. You cannot do it. Perhaps Theodore Adorno has learned something from Nelly Sachs.